It is good to serve a God that we know is dependable, not a God who shifts with times, is unchangeable. That gives us comfort. That encourages us as we go through life. These times are a bit tight. They are tight times. And uh, I remember driving through Kampala this week, and uh, it's like a Christmas break. Uh, the cost of living is going up because of the fuel prices. Many people are parking their cars. It's a difficult season we are going through. <clears throat> However, we are comforted by the words of the psalmist. Psalm 121, let me read it for you. I'll lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. Now, what are the hills? Some of us maybe are looking at a saving that we have. Maybe we are looking at uh, a promise somebody offered us and we're looking at those as heels. We're looking at the people we know as the heels that will, that will help us in this time. Israel is a mountainous country, as you know. So when these nations were in battle and uh, they were probably fighting in the valley, they would look up to the hills to see if maybe they have some support, maybe uh, you know, a partner state will come in and give them some reinforcement. So the psalmist David was a great warrior was talking about that. Uh, in verse two, it says, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. David, one of the greatest warriors, knew that help comes from the Lord. Verse three, he will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Our God does not slumber. He is aware of everything that we are going through. Verse four, behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither sleep nor slumber. In such difficult seasons, sometimes we look and we say, where are we going? Uh, the fuel prices, the cost of living is going up. Uh, yesterday I went to the shops and uh, I've been buying a cassava flour for about two years now. And uh, they had added a thousand shillings. You know, so when you look at all those things, families are squeezed, budgets are pushed. Are we together? However, the Bible tells us in Isaiah 59, 19, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Amen. So that means that even in these difficulties, the spirit of the Lord is able to lift up a standard and we can cope, not only cope, but also thrive in these times. Amen. We also remember Romans 10, 13, which says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Therefore, let's just uh, call on the name of the Lord even before we start, that the Lord will not only save us, but will make us go through these uh, trying times, uh, projections have been made that a uh, little of fuel will be 8,000 shillings, some are saying 10,000 shillings, but we just want to pray. As the psalmist said, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So let's pray. Father, I want to thank you because indeed you are an unchangeable God. You are an unshakable God. You are an unstoppable God. So Lord, today we look up to you. We call you to be our Lord in this season. The entire world is going into a direction that we don't understand. We are having uh, price escalations in every area and many other challenges, Lord. But Lord, your word has told us that when the enemy comes in like a flood, that your spirit will lift up a standard against him. And Lord, we thank you that your word is true and is forever settled in heaven. Even now, Lord, we look up to you. Let your spirit lift up a standard against all the challenges that we are going through. Father, we also pray that you will save us through these times, that we shall maneuver, that you'll save your people, Lord, in this nation and beyond, because this is a global thing, Lord. May you preserve your people. We bless you because you are good, you're faithful, and your laws are just. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, friends. Uh, my name is Frank Magoba, and I'm glad to be your host uh, this afternoon. And uh, I'll quickly uh, 
just give you an intro about today's message. I have not listened to it. Doctor has it. Just like you, I'm also waiting uh, to be sharpened, to be empowered, to be educated. Amen. As the scripture says, deep calls unto deep. Uh, from this platform, some of the messages are deep. Uh, a few times I have to listen to them, maybe twice, maybe three times, take notes and then come back to them. You know, that kind of thing. But we are glad that the Lord is taking us deeper. Uh, the church needs to understand these things. And we really want to thank God uh, for the message that he has given Dr. James Magara. Last time we learned about the image uh, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had in a dream. Uh, we had of those four empires, those four kingdoms, uh, each of the body shapes, not each. Uh, I think it was the, the, the human body was broken into four shapes. Uh, but basically they represented kingdoms. Uh, the first one, which was the Babylonian kingdom, the Med Persian kingdom, the Greek kingdom, and the Roman kingdom. And this image was destroyed with a stone. The stone crushed that image. That rock was Jesus, who came to establish an everlasting kingdom. We also learned that the kingdom of God is actually here. And we want to thank God that we are part of his ministers. We are part of the kingdom. And therefore, we need to be equipped. Uh, I'm reading the book about uh, the US Army and how they train the Navy SEALs swimming through cold waters with sharks. And that is what it takes to be good. That's what it takes to be excellent. So just as it is in the physical, even us as Christians, we need to be sharpened. We need to welcome messages of this caliber because they make us stronger in times like this. Amen. Therefore, allow me to welcome our speaker this afternoon. And as you all know, our speaker does not need introduction. He is a leader in the church, both locally, on the continent, and worldwide. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. James Magara. He is a teacher of the word, and he has got a revelation that he really wants, on, wants to pass on on the body of Christ. Therefore, friends, ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Dr. James Magara as he delivers his message today. Please send something to show that even if you cannot maybe scream or shout, but at least just send something. Uh, on Zoom to acknowledge that we are glad to hear from the Lord this morning. Thank you so much. And over to you, Dr. James Magara. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. And uh, very good to be again together after one month. Uh, uh, we are continuing uh, our study of uh, arise and shine or sit and wait for the rapture. We're really studying the last things, what is called eschatology. Uh, deep stuff, I'm trying to make sure we don't drown. And uh, there are some areas I'm not even going to, maybe too deep water. But I think the reason we're doing this is to get um, an understanding of what God expects from us. Um, we made a statement sometime back that your eschatology, eschatology is a study of the last things. Your, the way you understand how this world will end determines the way you live your life. And um, uh, I've been a believer for many years now, for some decades now, actually. And I remember in the 70s, the, the, there was a very strong understanding of or, or one particular way of understanding what would ha happen in the last days. It affected our thinking a lot. And I believe right now God is um, all over the world. God is helping us get a good understanding, a fresh understanding of what he would do. We may not know everything, but I think there are definitely some theologies that have imprisoned us and made us of no effect to the world. Um, much of it is this escape mentality. And that is what we are nibbling away at. And I'm trying to do it with as much wisdom as possible. <laughs> uh, and I uh, pray that I believe that the Lord uh, is guiding us through this process. So I'm going to share my screen as we, we take on uh, what our portion is for today. And that is the, the book of Daniel. 
we've been studying that book. Uh, we started last week and we're going to continue today. Okay, let me just ensure my screen is showing properly. I think it's shown now. All right, so arise and shine or sit and wait for the rapture. <clears throat> we're looking at Daniel's uh, end time prophecies, part two. Thank you, Frank, for reminding us about what we studied last time. Uh, God showing his plan of the ages to a king who was leading the biggest empire of the world at that time, a wicked king at that, Nebuchadnezzar. Nevertheless, God is not limited. He can speak to anybody. Uh, if he can speak to the devil, he can speak to anybody. So <laughs> he speaks to him and shows him uh, what is to come. And we, if you haven't listened to that, please listen. It's foundational. It's very, very key for us to understand uh, what uh, God's plan is for the nations. Um, we looked at um, uh, this, just a recap to it, this uh, guiding theme from last year uh, when we focused uh, 50 days of prayer and fasting on the church. Um, I will build my church. And uh, so again, I want to point you back to those, if you haven't listened to those series, they're there they're on our, UGN, uh, our YouTube channel, please look into them. I'll find you that statement where Jesus just say, it, I tell you, your Peter, and on this rock, I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I just need to underscore that. The gates of hell will not prevail. Uh, a lot of the thinking of the end time has painted a picture where the Satan overcomes, the Antichrist overcomes, and basically uh, um, Jesus comes to do a rescue operation to, 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 to rescue his bride who's about to breathe her last. Uh, that is not a picture that we see in the scriptures. And I believe by the time we finish, we shall have a better view of what God is doing in our days. And uh, we did we emphasize and re-emphasize again uh, that Jesus made the statement about the church. He says, I, he made a personal commitment about this new group of people that were coming on the earth called the church. I will, uh, he was committed to it, is determined. He didn't say I might, I'll try. He said, I will, I will build. It's been a slow, drawn-out process, about 2,000 years, and he pastoralizes it, my church, my church. Again, we have to emphasize here that the church belongs to him. It doesn't belong to human beings. All of us who are under shepherds, and I'm an elder in the church, so I'm also an under shepherd. I don't carry the title pastor, but because I'm an elder, I'm an under a shepherd. I have to keep reminding myself that people belong to God. They don't belong to me. The moment you begin owning people and thinking that your property, you're in trouble because uh, Jesus, they belong to Jesus. I will build my church. I will build my church and he can do with them what he wants, you know, uh, because they are, they belong to him. Okay. So my church, uh, my ecclesia, my called out ones, that was a, um, a local term for like my LC, it was a common term used in the time Jesus talked about. He, he chose a, a, a common word, uh, which was an assembly, um, the local assembly. So it tells us something about the church, the gates of hell, the councils of hell. Today, there are so many councils of hell because God is revealing what Satan has been doing for a long time. We're beginning to see it. We're not seeing many of these things, but we're seeing them. All of a sudden, you can feel overwhelmed and say, oh my goodness, the enemy is up to this. The enemy is up to that. And uh we need to watch against that because um, it's like going to the promised land and you see, oh, the, 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 the giants are this big, the walls are this big, the, the spears are this big. Uh, we must not allow that revealing to get us into a state of despair. The gates of hell will not, Jesus said, they will not prevail. And so whatever the enemy is up to um, with all his cronies around the world, Whatever they are doing, it will not succeed because Jesus said it will not succeed against the church. So I, I can hear you saying amen wherever you are. Uh, that's the mindset we need to have, that the enemy will not succeed. Yes, he will plot. He will, plot. He will announce his plots. He's like um, uh, Goliath. You know, Goliath was, uh, I had someone say this, was built for intimidation. But he didn't fight. He didn't do any fight. I think he just showed up and people just ran. Yeah, everything about him, his size, his uh, armor, his, the size of his spear and his shield. He didn't even have to carry his shield. Somebody carried it for him. The man was built for intimidation. That's what the enemy is like. He, he intimidates. Even now, the economy, we need to, to it's, it's an intimidation. Uh, we need to look beyond that and say we come in the name of the Lord, just like David did. 
Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail. They will not prevail. Amen. Now, uh, just uh, going back to the book of Daniel, I think I will avoid um, spending much time there. We talked about Daniel, how he was uh, uh, exiled, taken out as a young boy, and uh, you know, went to the foreign land, served in the palace of the king, several kings, and God gave him a little revelation concerning government, the area where he was called. Um, and uh, he, what through him, God was able to show us a picture of what is to come in the years. This is what uh, Frank was referring to, which we saw last time, the, the, the four kingdoms. And uh, it's just not what he's saying, that the stone, it was a stone that was not thrown by human hands, which came and hid the statue at his feet. <clears throat> and uh, that stone, remember Jesus himself saying, uh, uh, the, the, the stone that the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone, you know? He's talking about himself, the stone that the builders rejected. He's the stone that was cast out of the kingdom of heaven, a mountain, uh, and came down and hit uh, this statue. And uh, if you look at the fall of the Roman Empire, the Christianity, though, though, though Rome tried to strangulate Christianity, and if you uh, again look at the, the series we did during the 50 days of fasting last year, the history of the church. We talked about the persecution of the church. They did everything they could to ban Bibles, ban people, ban the church outlasted. The church outlasted Rome, and today the church has spread out to all corners of the world. Uh, and it is still growing, still destined to grow, to become a mountain that will fill the whole earth, as we saw. So if you didn't watch that series, please go back, and uh, it's on the YouTube channel. I'm sure uh, Alan, one of those who can post the links for those who are not, uh, take time to listen to the series um, of uh, what we did last week and also on the history of the church. Now, um, just a bit of a background as we begin looking at Daniel chapter nine, this is a bit of heavier stuff. Out, I'm, going to, I'm going slowly on it um, because it's important we understand it. And uh, I, I know part of what we're doing today is undoing uh, certain understandings of this passage. Now, the Old Testament explains that the people of Judah were taken to exile uh, because they failed to live in line with the covenant that God had made with Moses. And uh, prophet Jeremiah was the last of very many prophets to warn his people of imminent judgment. He had uh, an, an unenviable position of fulfilling a mission where, which, where, which was guaranteed to fail. Because the Lord told him, speak to them and they'll not hear, but just speak anyway. <coughs> So the result was the exile, uh, which Daniel, we told Daniel went into. Now we've done chapter two. Um, I would like to uh, go to chapter nine as we begin to look at this. In chapter nine, we are told that uh, Daniel, at the end of the 70 year period, towards the end of the 70 year period, to the very end, he'd been reading the book of the Lord given to Jeremiah, that the desolations of Jerusalem would last 70 years. Now he was aware from his own counting of the years that the 70 years were about to end. And so he turned to God in prayer, he made a confession, he asked uh, that the, the social of Jerusalem would end and the continuing wrath of God against his people would be averted, that Jerusalem would once again be rebuilt and become the place of God's habitation. <clears throat> now, so what, you, what, what uh, um, I would like to highlight here is that the 70 years was the duration that God had prescribed for the exile. You know, Jerusalem would endure 70 years. And the reason was that they had been ignoring the Sabbaths. They had been ignoring the Sabbaths. Um, in 2 Chronicles 36, 20 to 21, we are told that uh, he took into exile, that is now the king of Babylon, took them to Babylon, those who had escaped from the sword. So many were killed, but some survived and those were taken. And they became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Pasha. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths, all the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So God counted off 70 Sabbaths. Uh, he was counting his clock. The, the, the God had told them to observe the Sabbath and not observing it. So, well, he waited. You know how patient God is for 400 and something years, as we'll see, 490 years. Each day, um, he was counting. It was counting, counting, counting. Each, each week, rather. 
So this uh, indicated that 490 year period prior to the exile, the nation of Israel had failed to honor its covenantal obligation to observe the Sabbaths, uh, which included, but uh, it, it was only about, about working on, on uh, not working on the Sabbath and they, they had ignored it. God had given them very strict instructions on that. And so God counted the years. And here we are told that God said, the land will now rest for all these years that you missed giving it rest. <clears throat> and so we have that period. Now, so Daniel um, is praying and he's praying concerning the past. He's praying concerning the previous 490 years of history. As he's praying, he says the angel Gabriel came and uh, began speaking to him. Now the angel Gabriel did not talk about the 70 years so much. Okay, he began from the 70 years, but he now looked uh, forward to the next, we call them 70 weeks. 70 weeks are marked for your people as we're going to see. So he announced the events that would take place in the following 490 years. And he announced that there would be a total of 69 weeks of years, 69 weeks of years until the Messiah, the Prince would come. And uh, when you look at the calculations on this, I hope you get some time afterwards to study this. It's quite intriguing that God gave, you know, God gave Daniel the ability to give history in advance and uh, pointing us the time when Christ himself would come on the earth. Uh, let's go here. <clears throat> so he says, while I was pray, speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision of the fast, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand um, speaking with me and saying, oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I've come to tell it to you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the word and consider the vision. So, 70 weeks. Says so 70 weeks are decreed about your people, is Israel about your and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring um, to, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both prophet and priest, or vision the vision and, and prophet rather, and to anoint a most holy place. Um, know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there will be seven weeks. Then for 70 to 62 weeks, it shall be built. Um, it shall be built. It shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. Now just note that there's, uh, the, there are six objectives that are highlighted in blue here. And uh, please note that it says 70 weeks are decreed to fulfill these six objectives. That is very important as we come to understand the different views of the 70 weeks. It says 70 weeks are decreed about your people, your city, two, one, two, three, four, five, six. In other words, after these 70 weeks are done, these things must be completed. All right. Then it says, and after 62 weeks, uh, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who come to destroy uh, the city and this sanctuary and this end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for, one, for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. Until the wings of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. <clears throat> right. Sounds confusing. So let's just, I want us to mainly today unpack one aspect uh, which, which is spoken about uh, in this passage here. So it says 70 weeks are decreed. According to Gabriel, the seven would witness the accomplishment the, the sevens, the 70 weeks would, or the sevens would accomplish the, uh, the, the, the accomplishment of uh, six, 
very, very clearly defined objectives. And uh, let's look at them. Now I'd like us to see how uh, did Christ fulfill this? Because there's a lot of, uh, part of the, the, the different interpretations come to whether Jesus fulfilled them or not. Uh, what are those seven things? Number one, he said in verse 24, to finish a transgression. The number two, was to put an end to sin. 70 weeks are marked for this. Number three, to atone for iniquity. Number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Number five, to seal both vision and prophet. Number six, to anoint the most holy. Some versions say place. Uh, whether it's a holy place or holy one, it's not very definite. Uh, but we'll look at what these things will be pointing to. So uh, again, just remind ourselves that when the angel comes, Daniel is praying about God forgiving the last, the sins of the last 490 years. The angel comes and tells him about the next season, uh, the 70 weeks that are marked for the people. Uh, all right, so let's first uh, unpack this that we see. And the, the, the underlying thing here is to ask ourselves, did Jesus fulfill these things or not? If he did, then we'll, have, we'll now come back with glasses, look at the different views um, of what this could mean. Um, all right, so let's keep going. I trust you're coming along. So the first thing that is mentioned there is uh, 70 weeks are marked to finish transgression. That's number one, finish transgression. Now we have to remind ourselves that the time that Daniel received these messages was in the time of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. Jesus hadn't come yet. In fact, there was a, not a good understanding of, the, of what to exactly would happen when Jesus would, would come. Uh, but people had an understanding that at some point God would deal with the question of transgression and sin. There would be a Messiah who would come. If we look in the new covenant, is there anything that tells us about Jesus finishing transgression? And I'd like us to go to the book of Hebrews. We are told in the book of Hebrews that Jesus became the mediator of a new covenant by means of his death in order to set people free from their transgressions committed under the first covenant, under the first covenant. And for this, we shall look at, the, at uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. It says, therefore, he's the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from transgression committed under the covenant. Now, it's just one of many verses, but we see that the, the death of Jesus, and remember Daniel was told that 70 weeks are marked, 70 weeks are marked to finish transgression. During this 70 weeks period, during the 70 week period, uh, transgression will be dealt with. And then it also says in the, in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse, four, verse um, um, 14, uh, it says, and, and by, that, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, finish transgression once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. So there was a dealing with sin, with transgression, the old covenant that you're saying now, but when Christ had offered but for all time, a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time till his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time, those who are being sanctified. So just note the language here. Um, we can deduce from these two scriptures, at least two witnesses here, that when Jesus came, and remember he himself said, it is finished, it is finished. So that, Andrew, I want to take you back to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Uh, 70 weeks are marked for your people and your holy city, number one, to finish transgressions, 70 weeks. In other words, within the 70 weeks, the transgression will be sorted, will be dealt with. Okay, so we've got the second one. It says to put an end to sin, to put an end to sin. Um, John the Baptist announced the Messiah, and as he announced Jesus coming, he used the words, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins 
of the world. And that's found in one in John chapter 1, verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, or the sin of the world. Uh, the New Testament uh, writers confirm this. Um, talk about his appearing once and for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. So that Christ um, uh, was sacrificed to take away the sins of many people. And that's the book of Hebrews. It says, for Christ has entered not only into holy places made with hands, not into holy places made with hands, but which are copies of the true things. In other words, the tabernacle of the earth was just a copy of the heavenly one but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the most holy places every year with blood not his own, but then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin, to put away sin put away sin. Look at uh, Roman Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 to put an end to sin. 70 weeks are marked for your people to put an end to sin by the sacrifice of himself. So again we see here Jesus fulfilled this and uh, Peter tells us in his writing that for Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Uh, there are many other scriptures in the new covenant in the pieces that tell us about Christ's work to put an end to sin. <clears throat> 70 weeks are marked for your people, number two, to put an end to sin. Now, the next thing it mentions there is to atone for wickedness, to atone for wickedness. Um, Christ's death was an atoning death. Uh, that is to take away the problem and bring reconciliation, the thing that was keeping us from God to bring reconciliation. And uh, the right of the Hebrews takes up um, Jeremiah's promise of the new covenant and applies it uh, to, when he says, I'll, I'll forgive their iniquities, their wickedness, I'll remember their sins no more. I remember their sins no more. Looking at uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, uh, Paul writes in Colossians, says, and, and you who were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh, is atoned taken away the problem, brought you back to him uh, by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Um, so again, we see here that Christ fulfilled the atoning for wickedness. Uh, Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that is in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Reconciliation. Now, at the time of the writing, uh, there's a strong, strong um, evidence that the, the book of Hebrews was written before AD 70, which was the destruction of Jerusalem. And you know, before the destruction of Jerusalem, they still had temple worship, they still had the sacrifices. What put an end to those sacrifices and up to now, from AD 70, they, they, they have never been restored again. There are some are trying to restore them. What put an end to them was the, the Roman conquest of Jerusalem in AD 70. And if this book was written before, as, as, uh, as uh, some strong evidence suggests, then the writer talks about an old covenant who is, which is disappearing. Uh, it is coming to an end. This is what you read in, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12 and 13, uh, that this is coming to an end. And, and, uh, but actually, conclusively came to an end when the Romans came in in AD 70. Very important date, very, very important date we're going to come back to uh, because it's also a very, it's a very big divide of the different understandings of some of these passages. Now, the reason we are going into this is to, to begin to challenge some of the viewpoints about the end time that uh, have uh, held us captivities, in captivity. So if it doesn't make too much sense now, just come along. It will, it will begin to make a lot of sense. Okay, so number four, 70 weeks are marked for your people to bring in everlasting righteousness. <clears throat> to bring in everlasting righteousness. Now, to be justified by faith is to be declared righteous when we have been 
been justified, when our sins have been taken away, God now declares us righteousness. Um, and again, we look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. So for our sake, he made him to be seen who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And Daniel was told that 70 weeks are marked for your people. Within this time, we shall bring in, God will bring in everlasting righteousness. Uh, in, in, uh, in Romans chapter 5, Paul, Paul states, uh, for just as sin uh, came through one man, let me just bring that in, for therefore as one, tresp as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification, life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, the many are made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also reigned through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ our Lord. All right. So again, we can see here uh, that um, this also happened when Jesus came uh, to bring in everlasting righteousness. 70 weeks were marked for that. I'm emphasizing that for a reason. <laughs> All right, let's go on to number five. It says to seal up prophecy, vision and prophecy, to seal up. The purpose of a seal, um, in the olden days, it was usually stamped in wax by a person of authority. So the, the scroll would be um, uh, folded, and then at the point where the last flap comes in, to the wax would be placed, and then there would be a seal. And that would be to establish the authenticity of a document, uh, the seal. So Jesus himself uh, stamped his seal of approval on the Old Testament prophecy, fulfilling everything that was written about him. And there are two passages that I'd like us to look at here. Uh, maybe we'll start with the bottom one, where Jesus said, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I've come to put a seal. I've come to put a seal on them. And uh, in, in, uh, in the book of Acts chapter Three, Peter is speaking and he says, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. All the prophets who have spoken have foretold these things. All the prophets who have spoken have foretold these things. So number, number, number six, again, remembering 70 weeks are marked for your people. The sixth thing was to anoint the most holy. Now, it lists, left as most holy. Some, some versions say most holy, uh, holy one. Others will say most holy place. Um, it's not very uh, specific what that meant. And uh, people who interpret the Bible have various viewpoints on what that is. <clears throat> John the Baptist, uh, it may, when we look at his, what he said, may suggest that he's referring to a person or a people. Uh, it says, I baptize you with water uh, for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That's the book of Matthew. So John is prophetically, and I was prophetically announcing here that Jesus will be characterized by a, mini, a ministry of anointing or immersing people in the Holy Spirit to anoint the most holy one. So could this be referring to the body of Christ, uh, the church, the day of Pentecost, which uh, the Holy Spirit anointed, began to anoint human vessels who became the habitation of God, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special po 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 possession. That's First Peter chapter two, verse nine. School of thought thinks that, and I tend to align more with that school. Um, we, uh, this could have been more likely referring to the church, God's people, uh, who would now become his habitation, his bride, the church that Jesus spoke about. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. But anointing them, empowering them to continue his life and ministry in the world, um, this is one possible understanding of that. And we read it in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18 to 21, that through him, we have both access in one spirit to the Father, so that so then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens 
with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, Christ himself being the cornerstone. Now that word stone comes up again. In whom the, the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple, holy one, to anoint the most holy, okay, most holy. So grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place to God for God by the Spirit. So um, different interpretations there, but definitely we cannot deny the fact that as people of God now, we are the habitation of God. We are a holy temple, and it talks about anointing the most holy one. We know that on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came, and the, uh, and the, the people who were um, ordinary poor are now filled with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was poured out for flesh. Now, let me just recap this. Uh, we can recap this because if you look at these six things that were mentioned uh, here um, by uh, by the by the angel to to um, Daniel, we can see that they are all fulfilled in the coming of Christ. I just want to bring this up again for us to see. Okay, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your city, your holy city, Jerusalem. Number one, to finish transgression. Number two, to put an end to sin. Number three, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. And that holy place could well be speaking about the church. <clears throat> And then says, know therefore that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem, the coming of an anointed one will be seven weeks. Then it, it breaks down the, the seven weeks. So the angel breaks them down. Now, but 70 weeks, just know that 70 weeks are marked to fulfill all this, to fulfill all this. Now, let me begin to now come, I'll now come around to the different views about what this, this 70 weeks are. A very popular understanding of the 70 weeks over the last century, really, was uh, the one that counted up the coming of Christ. And they said there's a seven, there's a, there's a week missing. There are seven years missing. Uh, let's look at them. And I, I will let you now exercise your mind. We shall come back to it. And uh, this message is available on uh, our YouTube channel. You can look at it again. Um, and uh, I'm not going to give you all the answers. I'll just ask you now to begin to question based on what you've just seen, um, see, see question whether some of these views are actually correct. All right, so this is that we talked about dispensationalism. I'm sorry, the words are a bit small here. I, I borrowed a chart. This is really how they look at the 70 weeks of Daniel. And um, um, people interpret them uh, quite differently. Um, there, there are three main views, there are four, but three main views of interpretation. Uh, this has been the one that has been the most popular one. So if you look at this, this chart here, I'll try and get the cursor there. So the decree, they are, by the way, there were three decrees. <coughs> the, the, the decrees, there's a return of uh, um, under Cyrus, uh, the one under um, Ataxessus, Ezra, Nehemiah, there are three of them there. But the key one is this one here. Most uh, well, there are some people count begin counting from there, but they do count from most people count from from uh, the decree of Cyrus, and uh, and move forward. So they look at the seven plus sixty two weeks. Okay, this is how they view the seventy weeks, and the triumphal entry is seen as the mark of the end of the sixty two weeks. Then they say the dispensationalists believe they say then God stopped the clock. He stopped the clock, and the last seven weeks would be at the after the, the first return of Christ. Okay, and then there are seven years of tribulation. So they be teach about tribulation, and most of you are out of the tribulation because it's been the most popular uh, teaching in our in the last uh, hundred years or so. And by the way, um, that view is not necessarily the one that has been held all time. If you look at church history, it's not been the case. Uh, but uh, more recently, that has been one that has, and this this thinking has been one that has actually locked us up in a in a preparing uh, sit and wait, sit and wait, because Christ is coming to redeem us. Uh, so that is one view. Now, if you look at this, the question I'd ask is, if you look at the seventy weeks, 
why are we pushing those 70 weeks to the future, far into the future, when we can see that Jesus fulfilled all those things within this period? So maybe the time clocking there has a problem. Maybe there is a problem there uh, with that interpretation. Now, the covenant theology view, which is something we've looked at in this uh, series, has, uh, <clears throat> they generally take, a, a, um, when you look at most scriptures, they don't take them literally. They don't take the actual counting of years. So the seventh, um, the seventh week, or the, seventh, the week that is missing is not necessarily, they don't look at exactly the exact period of time, but they say you can learn, you can draw lessons from it um, to like an allegory, as they say. So uh, here, most, most people will agree about the first 69 weeks. It's the seventh week that is uh, contentional among most interpreters, interpreters of, the, of, the, of the end time. Now you see with the, with the, with the covenant theology of, of reformed futurist view, the seven and 62 weeks are clearly marked from the decree of Cyrus, but then they talk of the Messiah cutoff, you know, the death of the Messiah, the various events around the Messiah, but they continue counting. They continue counting. They say the death of Jesus didn't stop, but actually ended. Uh, the, the, the seventh week is it's very broad. They take it, they stretch it beyond. Stretch it beyond. So they say the seventh week is not exactly one week. It's now 2,000 years long. Again, uh, that's a very strong view that some people hold. There's a third one, which I've not introduced here yet, uh, but I think we should look at it now because this one has a lot of merit to look at. When they look at the 70 weeks, again, they look at those six things that Jesus uh, were said that would be fulfilled within the 70 weeks. And ex again, extend the time beyond the death of Christ to the destruction of Jerusalem. And they actually believe when you have uh, this, the Paul hold this view, um, it says a bit of truth in most of them, but the Paul hold this view uh, believe that the 70 years marked dead on time with the destruction of Jerusalem, because that's when the temple was destroyed. God put an end to the old covenant completely. And uh, much as Jesus had come and had been the birth of the church, the church was given time to grow, uh, not only from the initial Jewish, um, Jewish uh, uh, group it was, uh, but um, it moved to the, to the Gentile world. It spread out to the known world at the time. And then God put a complete end to the sacrifices and uh, the details about the destruction of Jerusalem and the desecration of the temple and even the people taken away from the land. And that was the first time that people, those who were looking from outside began to understand the difference between Judaism and Christianity because <clears throat> before then it looked like the new, this new thing called the church was a, was a sect within Juda Judaism. Uh, people from outside didn't realize there was an intense fight going on between Judaizers and uh, Christians. <coughs> uh, <clears throat> so this preterist view looks at the end of it. So in other words, according to them, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, 27 has already been fulfilled. We're not looking for another week. They don't believe and they don't hold on the view of uh, tribulation coming. Um, a lot of revelation has been fulfilled. We, we again, I don't know how deep we'll go, we'll sense. At some point, we need to touch revelation. <clears throat> we also need to understand Matthew 24, which has uh, been called the Oliver Discourse, Jesus preaching about uh, uh, prophets, uh, talking about things that would happen in the future. Preterists um, actually look at most of that as have been fulfilled already uh, by the destruction of Jerusalem. And so if that is true, then it changes the paradigm completely. You know, it changes the paradigm completely. Also going back to the, to the statue of, uh, of, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar saw, in the days of the fourth empire, the Roman empire, the God of heaven would set up a kingdom, which he did by the setting, releasing that stone, which the builders rejected to become the chief cornerstone, who was Jesus Christ himself. And it says <clears throat> that the, the that at the coming in of that stone would bring down all these kingdoms until there's no stress of them. And eventually this new kingdom would become a mountain that would fill the all of them. And the time would come and there's no stress, the east wind, the wind, the wind would come and blow away all the dust until there is no, uh, no trace of them. And then this kingdom would reign over the whole earth. Amen. <clears throat> 
So I, uh, I, I trust that in this message, you've gained a bit more understanding about the 70 weeks, or at least you've got uh, handles to help you do your own reading. I uh, emphasized the, the objectives of the 70 weeks was was very clear from Gabriel that these 70 weeks were marked for those six things. I've shown that Jesus fulfilled each and every one of those objectives. <coughs> and um, even indicated that the, the anointing of the most holy very likely could be referring to the anointing of the church, which, which carried on the message, which was what came out of the closure of the old covenant and the beginning of the new, and which continues up to today. Now, with that understanding, uh, you can go back and review what you believed about um, the seventh week, um, uh, which has been taught a lot. So the seventh week, uh, some of a sudden, the church will be taken away and the Jews will again become the primary center of communication in the world. Um, I think there are questions that I have about that. I think God, every nation, God, God has called, therefore called the nation of Israel to fulfill certain roles which they did very, very well, and it still has a plan for them. Uh, but um, this understanding that has, um, we've held on to, um, I think is one of those things that has held us back. All right, I think I should stop here and uh, have time for questions. Back to you, um, Frank. Yes, yes, doctor, thank you once again. And uh, uh, this is still that heavy meal. Uh, but uh, God is faithful. We will continue to interpret. And uh, I see one question in Q&A, but uh, maybe doctor, I'll start out and say, uh, how can you guide our further research uh, beyond the Bible? Uh, maybe if you can recommend one or two books uh, that we can read, uh, that would be great. Uh, but members, I encourage you to be posting your questions and, and uh, doctor will take them. I'll be reading from the Q&A, so I have only one question uh, so far. Let me read that and doctor will take that question and mine. Uh, okay, it comes from uh, Nabeta Luailume. It says, what does each week represent in terms of calendar time? Uh, I think he's asking how many years or translate into a week. Uh, yeah. I'll, let you take those, doctor. Thank you. Uh, 70 weeks. Uh, if you take 70 weeks, you multiply by uh, uh, how many days in a week? 70 weeks. 70 times 7, right? That is 490 years. 490 years. That's what he was well talking about a period. Now, what's interesting is if you go back, I didn't, uh, maybe next week I may dwell a bit, next time I may dwell a bit about <clears throat> on this. Uh, you can actually go into the maths, which I, I didn't, want, didn't want to do now, but you find out that it's an amazing prophecy because it, 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 it pinpoints the time of the coming of the Messiah and the time of the Messiah will be, will be cut off. Actually, depending on how you interpret it, the, the preterists look at it as the time. In fact, for them, they look at it as uh, Jesus, Jesus, three and a half years uh, of his ministry the seven year period, three and a half years of his ministry, at the time when he was baptized, when he, he came out and uh, to John the Baptist and was announced as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world. They, they marked us as, as, as the time uh, when he was, uh, he was revealed and then he was cut off three and a half years later. I haven't gone into that detail, but uh, really to answer your question, uh, each day of the 70 weeks is, is, one, is one year, um, is one year. I started off by looking at the, the, the period of time that um, the, the, the Jews had uh, in the book of uh, Chronicles that they had taken without marking the Sabbaths as they were supposed to do, God counted them. And uh, if you look at those, uh, that period of time, the seven, it was, this was 70 years, it's not exactly the same, but uh, it, it points, the, the rough correlation is still 490 years before and then 490 years. But looking at, it, to answer your question directly, the 70 weeks, each one of them is referring to, to each day is referring to, yeah. Back to you, Frank. And you here we present a year. Frank, I have you. some books yeah, that you can. Yeah, there are two books. Uh, now, there are many books that are, there's so many books about the end time. Um, 
and there are some that I read many decades ago, which have now, you know, <laughs> events have overtaken them. But there are two books that I would really recommend. One is called uh, Win the World, Escape the Earth or Win the World. Escape the Earth or Win the World. Then there is another one called, um, uh, I forget the title of the book. It's about a partial preterist. Let me just see if I can, can find it here. Um, Victoria's eschatology, Victoria's eschatology, a partial preterist view, a partial preterist view. Those are two good ones. Um, there are two, one or two others whose titles I, I don't have right now, uh, but those are two good books to 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 interact with. Uh, escape the earth or win the world, or maybe the other way around. Win the world or escape the earth, something like that. And then there is a uh, uh, Victoria's eschatology. And the main thrust of these books is God's, God's plan for the earth and with the church being told to go win the um, disciple nations, you know, take the gospel of the whole world could not have been one which ends up with negativity, you know, with the antichrist and all this stuff. And, and Satan has written on that a lot, saying that God has a victorious viewpoint. Now, yeah, let me leave it at that for now. Let's hear more questions. Thank you again, Doctor. Um, there's a question in the chat room uh, from Patricia Rutiba. And he says, she says, thank you, Doctor, for this. I was wondering how this ties up with the prophecy about 2021 revival starting in three African countries and included in those countries is Uganda. How do we prepare ourselves for these and participate so that we don't ask what happened? Uh, that's coming in from Patricia. Let me get you one more. And this one was answered. This is, no. Yeah, this is an Nabeta Lwailume again. Okay. Jesus was baptized when he was 26 years old. Yes, we are told that his ministry started when he was 30 years old. His ministry was three years long help us to reconcile the different years. Okay. Uh, first of all, about uh, Patricia's question, um, the prophecy about 2021 and 2022, uh, prophecies like this are just an indication of what God is planning to do. Uh, the word of prophecy is a piece of God's the future that God brings into the present to say, I intend to do this. And uh, when he does that, he expects us to participate with him. Um, I remember the words that were given to, to um, Joshua. Well, Joshua told the children of Israel, uh, before they crossed the Jordan, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. I will do wondrous things among you. So God was saying, I'm going to do something. Prepare yourself, sanctify yourself. So when, the, when we hear words like this, what's the first response also is prayer. Like Daniel, Daniel um, in chapter nine the passage we've been reading he he, he did a search of the scriptures was he was doing his study then he realizes oh my god he says i understood so some things clicked in his mind he realized the time was near according to what was being prophesied what did he do he prayed he humbled himself and this is something that we need to be doing saying god an appointed time is near uh we want to be in a, in a spiritual place where we can move with you so that's number one um and uh, number two uh, is to, I, number two, we have to call, let me just put a word of caution because when God gives a word like this, sometimes there's an overdrive by people to be, you know, like to, to start it, to start it. I, I have been at peace. I've had those prophetic words, I'm doing what I should be doing, but I don't have this, this pressure to do something that will kickstart the revival. I mean, that, that is something you need to be careful about because you, when God has promised, when God will do it, if we do our part, he will know, and we'll be very surprised, by the way. When God begins to answer this problem, this, 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 uh, he's to fulfill his word. Often he does it in very unusual ways. You, you, we may be expecting large meetings and what, but God may begin a completely uh, an angle we don't expect. This is what happened in the coming of Christ. Um, I, don't, I don't think anyone would have guessed where Jesus was going to be born and by and to which family. You know, if, you, if there was to be a question and answer something there, I'm <laughs> I've got it wrong. Um, so 
let's be mindful of that. Let's pray into it. Uh, let's consecrate our lives, um, put our lives in order. But let's also remember that when God does things like this, it's a sovereign act. It's a sovereign act. Uh, he's, we're not. We're not. We're not supposed to be the ones to. You know. I mean, God will choose who He wants to work through. Um, so just to say, we shouldn't stress ourselves. Uh, and, uh, let's see as we as we do what we are called to do. Uh, see how God will answer without trying to work in the flesh. Uh, <clears throat> now, Mr. Nabeta, we may have some debate about when Jesus was baptized, how old was he? <clears throat> I think my understanding was 30 years old when he, when he was baptized. I don't think it was 26. I, I don't think I've seen that anywhere. Maybe there's some information, I don't know. Uh, it was 30 years old, but it, it, his public ministry lasted about three and a half years. Now, when you begin going into these different details of when, that's when you begin having these variations. There's a pre Terrorists, the partial preterists, then you have the dispensationists of all kinds of shades and views. Then you have the covenant uh, people also have different those this But the, the key things for me, I think the major point I wanted to bring out of this message is doesn't it appear that Jesus fulfilled all the 70 weeks? Could these 70 weeks actually be over? Not as we've heard that there's another seventh week which is missing. And I think I'm personally now convinced that the 70 weeks are completed. I'm not looking for another seven, the seventh week. From my own study, I'm convinced. Now, the details of whether it was, where it was, and I, I also now have come to understand that the destruction of Jerusalem is a very, very significant event. Um, it doesn't appear in the scriptures. It appears in history. The Romans hired a, a historian called Josephus who wrote a lot of detail. I mean, if you read, uh, I think we'll have to talk about it, the destruction of Jerusalem at some point because it 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 is so, so graphic that if you don't understand it, it looks like a, a line in history, but it was very, very momentous. And uh, in terms of the covenant, especially, it was the, the, the point where the sacrifices ceased completely. Even when Jesus was on earth, they were still sacrificing after he rose again. All those years, all those early church, they were still sacrificing in the temple. But the destruction of Jerusalem marked the end. And uh, it's, I've come to see that it's a more significant event than I've understood before. So we shall come to that. And at that point, you may look at some, some more details because you'll you're, so, so be analyzing it. I don't want us to be stuck in a theological debate. Remember, the major thing that we are looking for now is what should we be expecting? If we're expecting a snatching away anytime now, then what's the point? You might as well just wait for it. Uh, but if there's some thinking that has made us stuck in certain viewpoints that may not be correct, we need to challenge them. And that is the purpose for, even as I look, sift through the materials, I'm looking for something that goes in that direction. Yeah. Back to you, Frank. Yes, thank you again. Uh, learning a lot, and uh, especially that AD 70, I'm just reflecting that the Jews, uh, after AD 70 were scattered all over the world. We even have some uh, Jewish tribes in Africa, the Lemba in, in uh, Zimbabwe. And, and I, I still struggle to, for the significance of that, but uh, uh, you know, again, going to read more on that. Um, I, I have a question that I had skipped, I think uh, from Annette Ndegea. And the question is, has the Most Holy Church been anointed? Um, has the Most Holy Church been anointed? That is from Annette. And one more from, I think this will be our last question, uh, from Paul Wafula Wawire. And the question goes, where does the Ottoman Empire fall in all this awareness, I think, that it falls outside the time of Daniel's vision? Just curious, because of its influence in the spread of Islam across the world, where does the Ottoman Empire fall in this uh, in this uh, prophecy? Thank you. Back to you. Okay. Now, um, uh, I'll let your question about the church. The, uh, now, the last line there, the, the last objective of the 70 week was to anoint the most holy. Uh, some, uh, it was not very specific, but it was a holy one or holy place. Um, as I look at these things, it's becoming, I, I'm getting more and more convinced that that is talking about the anointing of the holy, both one and place. Um, it's, I don't believe it's talking about anointing Jesus, no? Uh, I don't believe so. Uh, but uh, but uh, it's, it's uh, the holy one, it's suddenly, you know, what happened at the time when Jesus 
Well, first of all, uh, the theme we've been following is I'll build my church in the gates of hell. Much prepared now. Question: When was the church born? When did and what's the anointing? Anointing to pour out of the spirit. So the day of Pentecost then takes on a different, uh, a significant meaning because it was on that day, uh, Jesus, Jesus had risen from the dead uh, 50 days earlier. And he had been around for 40 days appearing to people and telling them about the kingdom of God. And then he tells them on the 40th day, do not depart from Jerusalem. So 10 days later, um, the, 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 the day of Pentecost fully came. The day of Pentecost was the feast, which was already there in the Old Covenant, because was one of the Jewish uh, feasts. And on that day, the Holy Spirit comes and anoints a group of people. And uh, we now have the birth of the church. I personally believe that is, that is where the anointing takes place. So has it, has it been anointed? Yes, yes, yes. Jesus said, if I don't go away, then he will not come. When did he come? He came on the day of Pentecost. And that has been running for almost 2,000 years from that day. Uh, the church has been growing. As we know from the study of church history, uh, the enemy came in so strong to stamp out the church. I mean, if the church, the, the Roman Empire, if, the, if, if there was a time the church should have been vanished during the, those first 300 years, of the of the church um, under the reign of the Roman Empire, because they did everything to burning Bibles, and they didn't have the number of Bibles we have today. Killing people, feeding them to to animals, throwing them in the fire, did all kinds of things. The church survived, and then the church survived the next um, one thousand years, where now it was now the opposite treatment. Not so much the persecution. But now, uh, hobnobbing with power, becoming so powerful, becoming so corrupt, becoming uh, so, so, so defiled, the church survived. And as we saw in church history, 500 years ago, God began to breathe in the church again. Jesus had said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Today, the church still has its issues, by the way, but if you look, compare, you cannot compare 2021 and 1920. <laughs> even in our own country. You can't compare what the church was in Uganda in 1900 and what it is today. With all our problems, the church has grown. We even went through Idi Amin, uh, where the Idi Amin also tried to stamp out the church. It didn't work. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail all over the world. I, I was just reading recently information that you know where the fastest growing church in the world is today? I was surprised. The fastest growing church in the world today is in the nation of Iran. Iran, there are, there are, there are thousands coming to know the Lord in Iran. Um, I forget the percentage now, it's growing so fast. China, China, China tried to get rid of the church. They, I mean, mostly too, they, they chased the missionaries who had been there for some time. They did have, they've done everything to they could, but they can. The church has just grown, grown and grown and grown. You cannot stop the church. So let's, 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 in our thinking about what the New World Order and the Deep State and all these guys are trying to do, they are not going to succeed because it's already written that world will not pass away. The gates of hell will not prevail against what Jesus has begun to do. So has it been anointed? Absolutely, yes. I believe the church was anointed on the day of Pentecost. Um, now, uh, the Ottoman Empire, I'm not aware of anything that specifically refers to the Ottoman Empire. Um, there may be, but I'm not aware, Mr. Ofula, um, of anything specifically. I know that um, there, there, there is, okay, there's a, there are a number of other isms that have come up, there's Islam, but there's now this whole you know, postmodern movement. Waves after waves of attack on the church uh, and people who have world agendas to take over. The words of Jesus will hold true. I will build my church and every council of hell there is no council of hell that will succeed unless the church. Uh, and we also know from the vision in, uh, in the book of, um, the, of Daniel chapter two, that this mountain, yes, which hit the Roman empire, came during the time of the Roman empire, hit it on its feet and eventually brought everything down that, that this is still going and it's not going to stop. It's just going to keep growing. And this gospel shall be preached to the ends of the earth. So we are part of the winning team. I, we need to keep that in mind. It doesn't matter what the enemy will do today. Please remember, we are part of this winning team. This team is going to win. Uh, it's great to, to play a game. You know, sometimes I, I don't like tension. I have enough tension in my life. So when I watch a football match, it gets so tense, I don't enjoy it. But you know, it's a different thing when you watch the match and you know the score is 
And then you can see the other team really giving this team a hard time, but you know the score at the end. And I think that's what I'd encourage us all to do, that whatever the enemy will do against us today, we know the score. We know who wins at the end. And we should keep that uh, attitude as we do whatever we do. We should have uh, a kind of, uh, uh, <laughs> there's a phrase about having something in your step, you know, knowing that this is the winning side. It is going to win. It doesn't matter who stands up. It doesn't matter how big Goliath looks, how big the enemy looks, or whoever calls himself what, they're not going to succeed. It's the kingdom of God that reigns over all. Amen. Back to you. Amen and amen. I know we are running short, but I've seen two questions. Maybe, Doctor, you can answer them quickly. Uh, one is coming from George Bamugemerere, and he says, James, thank you for the very enlightening teaching. <laughs> Could you please make a comment about the theology contained in the Left Behind series? It sounds compelling to me. The theology in the Left Behind series. And then there's one more from Auntie Teddy Mugabe, which says, is it true that God's 490 year covenant with Israel came to an end three and a half years after the cross? That is AD 3334 when Israel rejected the Holy Spirit by killing God's spirit-filled disciples? Uh, I think those will be the last questions uh, in the interest of time. So friends, we'll stop the questions here. Let me take Dr. Take these two quickly. Okay, two things. Left behind, Mr. Um, Bon if uh, we actually have addressed it a lot in this series. Uh, I've, I've not pronounced myself, but I think by now you can get an idea where I stand. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I, I really don't believe those series. Uh, I don't believe them. Um, they are part of this view that has, uh, and there are many theological questions you have about them. They made a lot of money, and they're very popular, but um, I don't believe that they, they bring out what God is doing in our day. Um, and I, I, I also, <clears throat> I just think as we go along, I think you, 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 how you judge for yourselves. I mean, I think my responsibility is to put truth before you. You can go and study and uh, be like the Berean Christians who listen and go and check out. But personally, I don't believe that is the storyline. It's also a very um, America-centric view. You know, it's like the world starts and ends in America. You know, we have most of the world actually doesn't live in America or in the, even in the Western Hemisphere. If you combine China and India, those two countries are almost half the world. Um, and many of these things have no mention of Africa. God is concerned about all the continents of the earth um, and all peoples. <clears throat> so in a long, short story to your answer, to your question rather, those left behind series make good reading, but uh, I put them in the realm of fiction. Um, when I look at the scriptures and the more I study them, the more I'm understanding that God is building up a victorious church, a church without spot and wrinkle, a church that has overcome the gates of hell, not a church that is that is being rescued on, uh, on, uh, uh, on drip, you know, uh, by a heavenly ambulance. That's not the picture that I see. I see a church that is victorious, the bride of Christ, learning to reign with her and uh, becoming salt and light, influencing all of society. Uh, that is the picture. And that is what we should be looking at. Um, <clears throat> and then Teddy, <clears throat> I think it's the partial precarious who have that view about the, the years ending uh, and the reasoning, this is the reasoning they have. But um, uh, if you look at the seven year period, they don't have the exact dates though, but they look at the first three and a half years of his ministry being the last seven years, <laughs> three and a half years of his ministry. And then they, <clears throat> they calculate the years, the point where okay, there, was, there was a time when, uh, when, the, when the, the vision appeared in Acts chapter 10, when, uh, Peter had this vision, kill and eat, Peter, between Peter and, and Paul, and God now opened the doors to the non-Gentiles coming in, that being the end of that uh, covenant. Because remember, the initial church was Jewish. The initial church had no Gentiles, and it took them a, lot, a bit of time to really appreciate that this new thing that God was doing called the church had both Gentiles and Jews. So there are some who hold that view. I don't have enough information to really pronounce myself on that. But I think what I'm becoming, what I've become more convinced about is that um, the, the, the destruction of Jerusalem uh, had a, a lot to do. It was actually the last seal 
we know that when Jesus died, uh, the temple, that curtain was torn in two uh, from top to bottom. And, uh, and uh, uh, so it was saying the way is open, but the sacrifices remained. It was actually after the AD 70 that that was put to an end completely. Now, I need to be careful here to say that I believe God still has a plan for the Jewish people. Paul talks about it. Um, and so I'm not talking about this being the end of Israel as it were. God has a plan for them. Just as God has a plan for every people and every nation, uh, each of us is unique in its purposes. They did fulfill a very, very special role in giving us the law, giving us the prophets, giving us the covenants, giving us the patriarchs. Um, and God still, though they were rejected, we are told they were rejected. Paul talks about their being rejected for a season. They will be received again. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Teddy. Um, the exact date, some, there's a view that holds that what you, what you pronounce that um, three and a half years after the death of Christ was about the date when uh, Acts chapter 10 happens, Joppa, kill and eat, or you shall not declare and clean that which I've declared clean. I don't know, I don't have enough information about that, but that is a view that some people hold. Frank? Thank you, thank you, doctor. And uh, really, I think you are just, you're encouraging us to gain more knowledge. The Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. So friends, my admonition to you is uh, we must uh, research more and study. Uh, what doctor is doing is to turn on the light bulb. And for that doctor, I want to thank you. Uh, personally, I've learned a lot. One more, thing. One more sure. thing. As you begin your study or as you go on your study, you will notice that there are many variations, but there are three main ones. There's the dispensation of you, which has been the most popular view. Uh, the second coming, the rapture, the tribulation, uh, you know, Amagadon and all those things. That's number one. The, the second one is the covenant theology view, which we've also explored in our series. Yeah, and again, if you're joining us for the first time, go back and look at what we've shared before. The third one, which I have <clears throat> I just introduced today, we'll look at more at it, is the preterist, preterist or what they call the partial preterist view, uh, which I think we need to examine a lot more closely. Uh, because it, 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 it will explain all the things we have in Revelation, by the way, but they'll explain them from a very different angle. And you, you, you'll you see it. So just be mindful of that. But uh, well, I think I'll leave it at that for today. We shall continue next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Doctor. And friends, our time is spent, but I'll request for five, maximum 10 minutes. So we bring this prayer meeting uh, to a close. Uh, it is important that when we have such a, a message, we pray into it. You know, it, it, some of these things, the spirit has to reveal them to us. Uh, so at this moment in time, I will uh, ask my sister, uh, Doris Chandiru, to come in and lead us in a prayer response. Over to you, Joe, Doris. Amen. Thank you so much, Frank. And uh, thank you, Doctor, for those deep insights. Indeed, the time for milk and meat is gone. The time is to chew bones. But the Lord will help us in this. It calls us to do more study and to understand, to be intentional, to understand the word of God, to understand the prophecies that we have seen, the 70 weeks prophecy and the six objectives. We're going to pray that the Lord will give us understanding. First, we will give thanks for this word and for God opening our eyes to see more. Let's pray. King of glory, we want to honor you. We want to thank you for such a time as this. We bless you so much for your word that you have brought unto us. And we pray that, Lord, even as we receive this word with thanksgiving, you give us understanding. Thank you for your servant whom you have used to relay unto us, O God, the things that you want us to understand in these end times, O King of glory, that you open up our understanding, open our understanding, that we may be able to reflect, reflect on the truth of the word, O King of glory. We want to thank you, O God, for the opportunity that you give us to study, O God. You give us the opportunity to hear from your servants. 
Lord, we receive this word with gratitude, and we ask that, Lord, we shall be able, O oh God, to meditate upon this word so that we may understand it in its fullness, that we may not go with the confusion of the world, but, Lord, we will have your spirit to guide us, O oh Lord. We thank you, O oh God, for you said you will build the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Indeed, one way you build the church is by giving us understanding of your word that we may be able to walk to greater heights, O oh God, and understanding of your prophecies and of your truth. Father, we thank you that the entrance of your word brings light and brings understanding to the simple, according to Psalm 119. 130, O oh God. Father, Lord, may this word bring light. May it enlighten our spirits. May it enlighten our eyes. May it enlighten our thoughts, O oh King of glory, that we may be able to understand and walk in understanding, that we will not be a people who are ignorant, but we shall be a people who understand this word. We ask, O oh Jehovah God, that you will help us, O oh God, open our understanding, open our eyes that we may see, open our minds that we may perceive right from your throne, O oh King of glory. May we be open to learning. May we be open, O oh God, to be taught, O oh God. Father, I pray that, Lord, we shall shall align ourselves according to your purposes so that we can see and know that which you have prepared lord many a times oh god we many do not want to listen to the end time messages oh god but lord this bringing to our attention that the time is now for us to understand these messages time is now for us to be intentional to know what is coming ahead of us the time is now for us to be prepared that when that time comes we will know that you have been with us we pray oh god that even as we say your word even as we study about the 70 weeks and times oh god that father your spirit will help us to understand you enlighten us more and more oh god we shall be a people who are knowledgeable, O King of God. Whatever resources that you have placed before us to use, O God, that Lord, we shall use them, O God. Father, help us. Help us, O God, in this season. That Lord, we shall be a people, O God, who want to know, who search your word, who search your word in its fullness. That Lord, we shall not only long for milk, we shall not only long for meat, but even the bonds, O God, that we shall desire to have them, O oh God, so that, Lord, we are able to penetrate through your word with understanding and with wisdom, even as we live on this earth, Jehovah God. We thank you, O oh God, for this series of the end times. We pray that, Lord, your spirit will continue to open our minds. You continue to guide us. You continue to lead us, O oh God, and give us a desire to want to know. Give us a desire to learn. Give us a desire to to. To, to acquire more knowledge in this season. Lord, we ask that, Lord, above everything, we shall be able to fulfill that which you have purposed. We thank you, O God, and we pray that, Lord, you seal this word with your blood, that it shall not be taken away from us by the enemy, but that our spirit shall be able to yield more to your spirit O oh god so that we can attain understanding and wisdom we pray above all that lord your will will be done continue to anoint your servant and bless him and give him more insight O king of glory and above all lord that as we grow together as the church O oh god we shall desire to build one another and to see that lord we all get that which you want us to do we thank you we thank you for your holy spirit who gives us spiritual insight we bless Bless your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.